If you will, go ahead and grab your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter one. We're gonna continue our Advent series we've called Anointed as we're walking through a portion of Hebrews and looking at uh, the threefold office of Jesus. And so this morning, as we look at the Advent uh, idea of peace, we're gonna look at Jesus as our great high priest who has given us uh, peace with God and peace uh, with others. And so that's the plan for us here this morning. On the screen is gonna be scripture I'm gonna use this morning. It's not a joke, uh, it's a lot. I know it's a McGowan joke he's used on me before, but uh, uh, it's, it's a lot. I was just gonna say the Bible, but thought I'd give you a little more than that. And so take a picture of it, uh, write this down if you want to. We're gonna go quickly through a lot of it. Uh, but I wanna build, I'm trying to build something that I think the scripture builds for us to understand. Uh, that we, a lot of us as New Testament believers, see what I mean? After Jesus had died and resurrected, is when we came to Jesus. Uh, we don't understand a lot of the Old Testament stuff and how it actually gives foundation to what we believe. So we're going to study a lot of it here uh, this morning. Um, also, we're continuing with our Advent discussion guides and prayer guides. And so if you want an Advent discussion guide, you can scan this QR code. There's, again, signs out in the lobby to help you with that. Just ways once a week to be with your family or small group or friends or roommates and just discuss these kinds of things. Maybe it's for you personally, devotionally. You can take this. There's questions and scripture to read. You can use all of that. And then the next thing we have is our Advent prayer guide. And so as a church, we are uniting in prayer daily uh, throughout this season of Advent, just seeing what God does in our own hearts and what he might do uh, to use us in our families and workplaces and communities. So you can scan that. It's on our website as well, SharonChurch.com, and then also on those signs out in in the lobby, and so that's all there for us. Last week, we started this series called Anointed, looking at Jesus uh, fulfilling uh, what the Bishop of Caesarea in 300 BC uh, called the threefold office of Christ, that he fills three Old Testament offices, the prophet, priest, and king. Each of these offices, so think of roles, had to be, you had to be anointed to fulfill these roles. So we talked last week about Jesus, his last name isn't Christ. Christ actually means the anointed one. So when we read Jesus Christ, it should read Jesus the anointed one, the one who's been anointed uh, to fulfill many roles, particularly the, the role of Messiah, which is a, a combination of these three roles. We looked last week at the ever-exciting Heidelberg Catechism, which I know you could not stop talking about all week long. Um, but we looked at that last week and how it's catechisms are a way that we've uh, traditionally throughout the church history, have taught our children deep, meaningful theology. And I know you think they can't learn it unless it's from TikTok or YouTube, uh, but they can. Uh, they can learn it from you and from the church. And so uh, there's questions and answers. And so the question in the Heidelberg Catechism is why is Jesus, why is he called the Christ, meaning anointed? And the answer actually helps us with this threefold office of, of Christ. The response is because he's been ordained by God the Father, He's been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be this, our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance. Secondly, to be our only high priest who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually pleads our cause with the Father. Thirdly, our eternal king who governs us by his word and spirit and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. And so last week was prophet, and today we're going to look at Jesus as the high priest. So from that catechism, he is our only high priest who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually pleads our cause with the Father. So let me give us just a few more uh, means of catching up and review. Last week we talked about the priest, the role of the priest, or the prophet, I'm sorry, the role of the prophet was to stand between God and man or God and humanity, and the prophet would speak to humanity on behalf of God. God would speak to the prophet, the prophet would speak then to humanity. And we studied last week that Jesus is the final prophet. Please don't misunderstand that he, I'm not saying like other religions believe he was a prophet. What I'm saying is the role of the prophet in the Old Testament was put in place specifically to point to Jesus. And when Jesus came, he fulfilled that role. How? By not only speaking the word of God, but by being the very word of God. He fulfilled it, which means we don't have prophets today. Since the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, we haven't seen another prophet on the planet. Jesus is it. He's the final word. Uh, he always has been, always will be, not created by the Father. He is the Father. He is, he is God. It's part of the Trinity, God the Son. And so this morning, I want to look at the role of the priest. While a prophet speaks to the people on behalf of God, a priest sits in between, but he intercedes. A priest intercedes on behalf of the people, 
before God. Do you see the distinction? That's the role, primarily the role of the priest. And so that's what we're gonna study this morning uh, throughout apparently the entire Bible. We're gonna study that here this morning. Uh, I don't know what your week has been like. Uh, it's been a few weeks for us. Thanksgiving week, uh, our middle son, Kaysen, uh, had strep. Uh, a few days later, K- Landry started strep after Thanksgiving. And so uh, they were home most of the week. Colton then got what we think was the flu or something real bad uh, last, last week, two weeks ago. So he was out all week. And then this week, to start off with a bang, we had an ER visit. Uh, so we were at Choa ER for most of the day Monday. Uh, and then while we were there in what is known as the Petri dish of disease in the ER, uh, I started feeling sick. I came home. I got a flu test. I tested positive for the flu uh, this week. Meredith had the flu this week. It's just been, it's been a week. Anybody else have a week like that? Or just a month like that? You just, it's like it just won't stop. I need it to stop, and it won't stop. And so I was, I've been trying to study this week, uh, but I'm on cold medicine, all sorts of things, so I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea what's going to happen this morning. <laughs> Not a clue. I don't even know what I've studied. I have no idea. Um, uh, but I say all that... Uh, <laughs> Just to say that um, yesterday morning, um, I'm, just, I'm just tired of just being at home and doing nothing. And so I started to feel a little bit better. I wake up, Landry's woken up, and I'm like, man, what do you want to do? I asked Landry, and she said, I just, I want pancakes. And I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. Let's make us some pancakes. And so I go to the pantry. Uh, there's not a box of it, so we have to make it from scratch, which means you have to pull out your entire pantry just to make a few pancakes. Have you noticed that? The box makes it so much easier, and so we begin pulling out um, ingredients, and the entire kitchen island now is full of ingredients that I didn't know uh, we needed for all of this, and we do, because now she wants chocolate chips and her pancake, and then the whole thing. So I'm telling you that to tell you this. This morning, here's what it's going to feel like for the first two-thirds of the message. It's like we just emptied the pantry. It's what it's going to feel like. And you're going to be like, "Do do we need all of this? Like, seriously? Like, all of this? And then we're going to get measuring cups and teaspoons and then also tablespoons. You can't be confused by which is which because that makes a whole different pancake than what you thought you were making. And so you can't do that. And so here's the temptation. I want to just encourage you. The temptation is to check out, and I don't want you to. The second temptation is to begin to eat the ingredients one at a time. And I would caution you, don't do that either. Uh, no one wants a raw egg on Sunday morning. Don't do it. Uh, now, some ingredients, they're fine by themselves, right? Like the chocolate chips, you can eat on them. The problem is uh, they're not going to give you any sustenance. So we're going to pull a lot of ingredients out of the Old Testament. And if, you can, if we can do it, if we can just fill the island up, there's, I hope that there's going to be some good, delicious chocolate chip pancakes at the end of it. I hope so. Not literally. I'm not that kind of guy. But figuratively, but we can all figuratively eat chocolate chip pancakes together uh, at the end of it. So if you're with me, that's what we're going to try to do this morning. We're going to, we're going to empty the pantry. So we're going to try to do first and then try to build into uh, what God has for us this morning. You've got to remember the Bible is one unified story. It's a big, epic narrative, and it all leads to Jesus. The Old Testament points forward. The New Testament points backwards. Everything is fixed around this person of Jesus. And what we celebrate at Christmas is that. We celebrate the final coming, the, the culmination of all of that. The apex of history all happens there. Uh, but many of us, that's all we know. And so we get uh, lost in a lot of uh, the ebbs and flows of culture. And so for the next uh, few weeks, we're going to study from the book of Hebrews. We're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 1, the author of Hebrews. We don't know who it is, don't know who the audience is, just that they're Hebrews. And they have a vast understanding of the ingredients of the pantry, if you understand what I'm saying. They understand it. And they know how to make a pancake. We don't, and so we need Hebrews to help us. So here's how the author begins to remind us how great Jesus is, that he's the point of all of it. Hebrews chapter one, verse one, long ago, he says, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers or ancestors, that's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all of them, by the prophets. But in these last days, so even the author of Hebrews thought his days were the last days, so don't be deceived into thinking the last days means that Jesus is coming at the end of this year. It's always been the last days since the first days. Now we're in the last days. He's spoken to us by his son, whom God appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God. He's what we see of the glory of God, the exact imprint, the character of God, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And here's the end of verse three for us this morning. After making purification for sins, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, we read that, we're like, cool. He sat down, wonderful. There's a whole history that goes into that theologically rich statement there in Hebrews 1, verse 3. So I want to begin to unpack that as we empty out the pantry. So are you with me? All right. 
Grab your Bibles, go to Genesis, because that's where we're going to begin uh, to make our way through the rest of the Bible. It'll be on the screen if you want to. You can turn in your Bibles, use your device, whatever you want. But what I'm hoping to do is if I want to give us, um, again, the ingredients to make this, make this pancake together. Genesis 3. So God's created the world. Everything is as it should be. Everything is perfect. Uh, Adam and Eve, humanity, have fallen into sin. Uh, there's a deceiver there, a serpent, uh, Satan, the accuser, the deceiver, and he's accused them and deceived them into falling into sin. And so God meets them. But here's, here's how they respond to the sin in Genesis 3, verse 7. The eyes of both of them, Adam and Eve, were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. The first humans, in response to sin, immediately feel the need to cover up whatever makes them different from each other. And uh, what exposes them before a holy God. That, that's what we're reading here. The first humans, the response to sin was to run from God and to cover themselves. Now, if you're honest about anything, be honest about this. That's your response too, isn't it? When you're busted in your sin, when you're busted in your sin of hypocrisy and arrogance and lying and gossip and adultery, when uh, lust, when all of that comes out, your response very rarely is to run to God. It's instead to run from him and try to pretend you're not as bad as you now realize that you are. That's my response. Maybe, maybe I'm preaching to me, but that's my response. How do I cover this up? So we, we go with fig leaves, whatever we can reach for to cover us. So God meets Adam and Eve. He calls them out on their sin. Adam's like, listen, it's not my fault. It's your fault. You gave me the woman. It's the woman and you. You guys combined to make me sin. If it wasn't for the woman, I would have been fine. I would have been totally fine. And all the men said amen to that. And then uh, the woman says, no, listen here. It wasn't me. It was that snake that talked to me. If, you, if that wouldn't have happened, then I wouldn't have. And so God in his grace deals with the serpent first. And here, here's the curse he gives to him. So you're gonna crawl on your belly. But then verse 15, I will put enmity, I will put hatred between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he, the woman's offspring, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So the curse for the serpent, for the accuser, is, listen, you've had your time, but there's a time coming where the offspring of the woman will crush you, step on your head, and you're going to bite at him. You're going to nip at his heel, but he's going to crush your head. Now, uh, the idea here is a venomous snake who bites the heel of someone and which would cause, ultimately would cause death. But here's, here's the picture we need to understand. We're trying to read the narrative of Scripture. From this point forward, Genesis 3.15, the story is set up for us to look for this offspring. That's who we're looking for. The story is set up for us to look for this wounded hero who would come and would crush the head of the accuser. We've identified the enemy and we've identified who we think the hero might be. And so we're looking for offspring, the offspring of the woman. Then there's this almost throwaway sentence in verse 21 that the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothe them. That's it. That's all we get. No fanfare. Doesn't tell us what skin, what animal. Doesn't tell us how it all went down. Tells us nothing. All we know is that there's this one sentence in the beginning of the Bible, the opening pages of scripture, that God wasn't satisfied with the fig leaves and instead gave them something else to cover them. And for the first time in history, the blood of an animal is shed. Death has entered the scene. But this death is meant to cover the sin and brokenness of humanity. If you read too fast, you blow, you blow right through it. And you think, oh, cool. Like now you can picture um, Fred and Barney Flintstone. Now it makes more sense why they're wearing what they're wearing. But that's, that's, this is important for us. God kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden for their own sake, kicks them out. And they have children. And we're looking for offspring. They have children. And we learn of, of two boys, Cain and Abel. And so in Exodus, or Genesis chapter 4, we read this next section. This is Genesis 4, verse 2. Uh, Eve gives birth and has a son, Abel. Abel was a keeper of the sheep, which makes him a what? Shepherd. And Cain was a worker of the ground, which makes him a gardener or a farmer. This is, this, these are the two men. Two sons raised by the same families. One's a shepherd with sheep. One is a gardener or a farmer who works from the ground. In the course of time, well, how much time? The Bible doesn't care to tell us how much time because that's not important. But in some period of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. He's a worker of the ground. He brings his fruit as an offering to the Lord. And so now you're asking, how did he know to bring an offering? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. We don't know. 
And I don't know that's important. What we need to understand is what's happening. And Abel also, Abel, the shepherd, brought of the firstborn of his flock. The firstborn of the flock of sheep is what animal? Sheep, that's fine, you can say it, a sheep. Uh, brings a sheep. Uh, Cain brings uh, gardening things. He brings um, vegetation. I can't think of any words right now. Uh, vegetation. Uh, and then Cain brings a sheep to the Lord. Abel brought the firstborn of his flock of their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So then you're like, well, why? Why? And even Cain's like, why? And God's like, just because, just because. Is it, I just, it just, that's all I'm telling you, because. Because I liked his better. Is that going to make you mad? Then we learn later in Hebrews, it's because of faith. But here's, here's what we've got to understand. Man falls into sin. There's separation from God. Man tries to cover himself with vegetation. Vegetation won't work. So instead, God sheds the blood of an animal and uses the skin of an animal to cover the brokenness of man. Fast forward some time later, and we find out that God has two offerings placed before him. What does he accept? Not the vegetation. He accepts uh, the shed blood of a lamb. Again, throw away ideas. You have so many questions, you miss the point of the story. And so that leads us now into some uh, other stories that happen. From there, we meet Abram. Abram is the father uh, of nations, later be called Abraham, the father of a multitude of nations. And Abraham um, becomes, he gets a promise from the Lord, from God, Yahweh, that he will um, have descendants that multiply, that, that fill more than the stars in the sky. And from his lineage will come this snake head crusher. The hero is coming from his lineage. They don't have any kids yet, but Abraham begins to lead people. And as he leads people, he becomes essentially a king. And so he leads his people in battle and he wins. He just destroys another, another nation. And so he's walking back to his, to his town with his people and he's walking through a region that we haven't met yet, this area we haven't been through yet. And in a seemingly random conversation, another king comes out. Here's Genesis 14, verse 18. Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He sees Abram passing by, knows he's the one who just led his people in victory. And he brings out bread and wine and he was priest of God most high. Now, we read that backwards through the lens of Leviticus. Like, sure, he was a priest. The problem is, at this point in Genesis 14, we have no idea what a priest is. Like, not a clue what a priest is. And it's the first mention of a priest, this man named Melchizedek, who's also a king. So now, we've met a priestly king and he brings out something and he blesses. Verse 19, he blessed Abram. And he said, blessed be Abram by God most high. He's a priest of Yahweh, although he's not of the lineage of Abraham. This is really confusing. It seems to make no sense. The possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be God, Yahweh most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then look at Abram's response. He gives this random king a tenth of everything. Now, you good church people, what's that called? A tithe. He gives a tithe to this king priest. Which again, reading back, like, yeah, that's great because that's what you should do to a priest. The problem is no one knows that yet. There's no uh, Levitical law. There's no priesthood. There's nothing. And yet we see this seemingly random interaction in Genesis 14 of Abram meeting a king priest who blesses him. And then uh, Abram gives him a tithe, a 10% offering back to him. You want to know what's even crazier is that where it says he's the king of Salem, that's the Hebrew word shalem, which in the New Testament will be called Jerusalem. It's in this hill area, this mountain area of the Middle East, and there's this king that seemingly appears out of nowhere. And then the story ends, and we get nothing else. That's all we get. Don't you love the Bible? Don't you love when that happens? You've got a million questions, and God's like, I don't care. No, now's not the time. That's it. So we meet a priest, we learn about a tenth, but nothing, nothing matters to us yet. Abraham and his wife are promised children. Uh, it takes too long, so they take matters in their own hands, creates a whole Jerry Springer episode that we don't have time to get into. They have a son, not the son. Ultimately, God blesses Abram uh, and Sarah, who's barren with a child. And the child's name is Isaac, which means laughter, because they laughed when they found out that they were in their 90s and pregnant. Um, I, I would not, laughing is not what I would do that that happened for me. But they laughed. They named their son Laughter or Isaac. And then not too uh, many years later, maybe um, Isaac's in his 20s or early 30s, God demands Isaac back. 
He tells Abraham to go sacrifice his only son to him. Here's the test, God's testing. Abraham, before I send you off and do what I need you to do, I need to know you love me more than you love what I've given you. Will you obey me? Testing your faithfulness. Abram and his son get up in the morning. They carry wood, a flame, and a knife up a mountain uh, where they will go. And Abram will sacrifice Isaac to the Lord. But again, the question is, well, how did he know what his sacrifice was? Because we haven't even gotten there yet. We haven't even gotten to that part of the story yet. Well, how did Cain and Abel know? I don't know. It just seemed like the response. It seemed like what you do. And so he builds an altar on this mountain. And you, uh, many of us, we picture like 10-year-old Isaac and And Abram's like laying him on the altar. No, no, he's in his 20s or 30s. Isaac's like, I got it, dad, I'm good. So he gets on the altar, ties him up, and rises. he's about to kill him. This happens in Genesis 22. Abram lifted up his eyes and behold, behind him was a ram, a ram from uh, like a sheep family, caught in a thicket by his horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering. What's a burnt offering? I don't know. I guess it's an offering when you burn it which is what we call the first few pancakes that we make. That's, that's what we call. This is our burnt offering. So the are trying to figure out the setting on the oven or the stove. Instead of, instead of, here's the phrase, instead of, in place of his son. So Abram called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said on this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. You wanna know the nickname for Jerusalem in the New Testament? The mountain of the Lord. So we're pulling out ingredients. So from there, God's people, Abraham's descendants, ultimately end up in Egypt as slaves. There's famine in the land. There's slaves in Egypt. And so God sends a deliverer from his people, uh, a guy by the name of, of Moses. And so Moses comes in with his brother Aaron, and uh, God performs these 10 plagues to set his people free. The last one, the plague of the death of the firstborn, or what we would call the Passover. It's on this night uh, that God told his people, hey, seven days ago, you should have got a lamb. You have that lamb in your house. I want you to love it and cuddle it and care for it. I want your kids to name it. And then I want you to kill it. I want you to kill it. And so then they need to kill, sorry. Then they kill the lamb. (laughs) Is that Landry? They kill the lamb. Uh, And then they would take the blood of the lamb in a bucket and they would take a branch and they would spread the blood of the lamb horizontally and vertically on the doorposts of their home to signify By the blood of this blemish-free, spotless lamb, we have been delivered and set free. By the shed blood of a lamb, the people will be set free. And we would call that the Passover. And God would tell them, I want you to continue to celebrate this. I want you to remember the day that I set you free, that by the blood of a lamb, I've set you free. And so they would do that. They walk through the wilderness. And then later in Exodus 28, as they're wandering through the wilderness, Um, God's leading his people by a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke, but he has no place to rest. He's he's just continually leading them. And in Exodus 28, God calls uh, Moses up on a mountain. And while he's there, he gives him the dimensions for what he would call his tabernacle or his home, the house of God. And here the, here's the picture of what it could have looked like. There were a number of different ways that they would sacrifice. And so they would have to sacrifice at the bronze altar. Uh, they would wash at the, uh, at the bronze laver. And then you got the holy place and the holy of holies. All Jews are allowed in the courtyard. Priests are allowed in the holy place. The high priest is allowed in the holy of holies. And so that's the picture that God resides in the holy of holies, at the Ark of the Covenant, where God's presence is. But he he creates a people that he would call the priesthood or priests. At the beginning of Genesis 28 in verse 1, God tells Moses, Bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests, Aaron and his sons. And so now God institutes a priesthood. These are people. Now we learn what a priest is. So now we're like, oh, that's what Melchizedek was. He was like this, yes. This is what he would do. A priest would operate in, on behalf of people before the Lord. And the primary role was to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. This is what a priest would do. And he would call them the Levitical priesthood because Aaron is from the tribe of Levi and they would be called Levitical, which is why we then get the book of Leviticus. In the book of Leviticus, we get all the different regulations for how this priesthood sacrificial system would happen. 
Here's what you offer and when you offer. Here's what this, this sacrifice would cover this kind of sin. This would cover this. This is what you do for washing. This is what you do to become clean. And the priest would have to be baptized. They would be cleansed before they'd step into this ministry of priesthood. So he gives them all of it. But the culmination every year is from Leviticus 16. It's called the Day of Atonement. Throughout the year, they're offering a bunch of different kinds of sacrifices, but on this day was a big one. This was the day that atonement would be made for the entire nation. But let me tell you how this day would have gone down. They were offering what's called sin or purification sacrifices. And the high priest would take three animals, a bull or a ram, and then two goats. And he would sacrifice the bull or the ram, and he would cover himself, sprinkle himself with that blood. He would eat of it, and that would cleanse him of his sin, because he's a human too. That would cleanse him of his sin. Then he would cast lots. He would throw dice for these two other goats. Whatever one it landed on, uh, he would become now uh, the sacrificial uh, goat. And so he would take that goat into the Holy of Holies, would sacrifice him, and then that blood would be, would be sprinkled all over the tabernacle. Because the understanding was that sin doesn't just affect us, it affects everything I come in contact with. It affects my workplace, it affects my marriage, it affects my kids, it affects everything. And so the life of the animal, the blood, the life would cover the death of sin and restore everything to its rightful place. The second goat, the high priest would symbolically put his hand on the head of the goat and would symbolically place all the sin of all the people of Israel on this goat. And then he would send him out into the wilderness, out as far as the east is from the west, taking all the sins of the people of Israel with him for the remission, for the remission of sin. That's the day of atonement. So in Exodus 16, we read about this. And God says, For on this day shall atonement, covering, be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord and from all your sins. It's a Sabbath, a holy day of rest, of solemn rest to you. You shall afflict yourselves. It's a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated as priest in his father's place shall make the atonement wearing the holy linen garments, the linen ephod. He was given that description in uh, Exodus 28, bright, shining, white apparel. He shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. He shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be a statute forever for you, that atonement may be made for the people of Israel. How often? Once in the year because of all their sins, both the sins they knew they committed and the ones they didn't even realize that they had committed. So that's all set up. It's practiced for years and years and years. And Israel now no longer is content to have a prophet or a priest. Now they want a king. Everybody else has a king. They had a king named Saul. Saul's a terrible king. But then God um, anoints David to be king. But David's not just a king. He's also a priestly kind of king. And so David makes his way into Jerusalem. He's taking the Ark of the Covenant from the Holy of Holies into Jerusalem. And he gets into Jerusalem and he builds a tabernacle, a new tent for, for, the, uh, for the people of God, or for, the, for God, in Jerusalem, on the high mountain in Jerusalem. And while he's there, he goes into the Holy of Holies wearing a linen ephod. And he offers a sacrifice on behalf of the people and he feeds the people. They party, he dances naked. It's a, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing that happens in 2 Samuel 6. But in chapter 7, he's like, this isn't good enough. I want to build a temple for the Lord. And the prophet Nathan says, listen, I'm I'm glad you'd like to do that. But God says, you won't, but a descendant of yours will. And then there's another descendant who will do even better than that. And it's in that moment that David writes Psalm 110. And Psalm 110 begins this way. The Lord says to my Lord, the descendant who's coming after me, this new king, this new priestly king, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. So David has this image of a descendant of his coming who will sit at the right hand of God. But he continues, and in verse four, he says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. This man who will sit is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And you're like, "Uh, after who, what now, where? Where? That random guy? Because at this point, uh, the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood has been established. So what you expect is, okay, I get it. The, that priesthood is what will set the tone for what this new priest king, Messiah, will be like. But that's not, that's not what God says. 
This priest isn't going to come in the line of Aaron. This priest comes in the line of Melchizedek before there even was a temple system, before there was a sacrificial system, before there was a Levitical priests and the whole thing. Okay, sounds great. And then after that, every other priest fails. Aaron has failed, Moses has failed, David fails. Anyone who takes the role of high priest is a broken, jacked up person and everything falls apart. And so we're still looking for the, the hero that was promised to us in Genesis 3. He still hasn't come. But now we've got all these ingredients on the island. Do you see them? And you're like, I'm going to make what out of what now? How much of this goes in there? And what do I do with that? Well, John the Baptist is going to help us. In John chapter 1, the next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we've got all the ingredients and there's different pieces of the mosaic I want you to see. And one mosaic that's being painted is that Jesus is the lamb. He's the Passover lamb from Exodus. He's the, he's the ram caught in a thicket in, in Genesis 22. This is, this is who Jesus is. But from that moment on, something miraculous happens is that Jesus is baptized. And while John baptizes him, the words that come from heaven are the same anointing words that Aaron would give to his sons as they would step into, into priesthood ministry. If you read Luke's version of the baptism of Jesus, he tells us that Jesus was about 30 years old, which if you read Numbers chapter 5, you would learn at the age of 30, someone can become a priest. So yes, he's the lamb, but it's better than that. He's also the one who sacrifices the lamb. He is our great high priest. So here's what I don't want you to miss. I don't want you to settle for half of the pancake. I don't want you to settle for him being the lamb. I'm gonna throw some chocolate chips in it and you're gonna understand it's better than just that. He's actually the high priest who sacrificed the lamb. He's not just a sacrifice. He's the sacrificer. As the sacrifice, that's great. But there's something more glorious that comes with him being the sacrificer. And that's what we're going to see here in the book of Hebrews. Jesus lives a perfect life. He's the perfect spotless lamb. Born of a virgin, never sinned a day in his life. And finds himself in Jerusalem of all times at Passover to be crucified, to be killed. And his blood would cover the sins of the world. All that happens there. The author of Hebrews wants us to know something better than that. So back to Hebrews chapter one, verse three. We just read it. After making purification, who makes purification? The high priest. We saw it in the day of atonement. We saw it in Exodus 28 in the role of the high priest. We've seen all of it in Leviticus. But what does he do? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And here's the significance of that, which we continue to see throughout the book of Hebrews. Every other priest would never sit down. Because the number that Mark referenced of how many animals would we have to be sacrificed, that priest is not sitting. He's killing stuff all day long, all day long. The priest doesn't sit. The priest only stands. The priest can sit when his work is done. And so what we read here is that our high priest, who has sacrificed the final lamb himself, now sits at the right hand of the Father. But the author of Hebrews isn't satisfied just to let us know that. He wants to tell us even more. Here's Hebrews chapter 6. You see, God made a promise to Abraham, that promise of I'm going to bless the world through your family, through your heritage. But since God had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abram, Abraham, having waited patiently, obtained the promise. You see, people swear by something greater than themselves and all their disputes. It's an oath that's final for confirmation. So what God wanted to do was to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, that's you and me, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. And we're like, yeah, the oath he made to Abraham. No, he made a promise to Abraham. The only oath we read about in the book of Hebrews is the oath God made in Psalm chapter 110 to David about a priest coming in the order of Melchizedek. You know what God uses to prove to you and to me that we are secure in him, that we are his children? He uses a high priest to tell us. Not a promise, an oath that he declares. 
So that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. Your hope is not just rooted in Jesus as the Passover lamb. Your hope and my hope is rooted in the fact that we have a high priest sitting next to God interceding right now for us. Not just that it did happen, but that it continues to happen. Because right now today, the serpent from the garden is accusing you and accusing me. And if we're gonna stand on our merit, our righteousness, we're gonna fail every time. But what the author of Hebrews is saying is, no, 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 it's better than just having a lamb. You've got the sacrificer of the lamb who says, no, 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 it's been paid for. That's the hope we have. That's the, verse 19, this is what he would say. This is, we, this is what we have as a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place. Who enters the inner place? The high priest. Behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And again, you're like, but there's a better example of priesthood. There's a whole description of them. Why, Why this one? Well, he's going to tell us in chapter 7. This Melchizedek? The king of Salem, the priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings, and he blessed him. And to Abraham, and to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He, Melchizedek, is first by translation of his name. Here's what his name means, the king of righteousness. But you've also got to realize he's the king of Salem, that is the king of peace. Author of Hebrews is saying it's better It's better that Jesus comes from the line of Melchizedek than the line of Aaron because every priest in the line of Aaron is a screw-up. Every single one of them. And all of them have to continually offer sacrifices. It's better. Jesus didn't come to fulfill the sacrificial system. Jesus came to fulfill the role of a priest. And the role of a priest existed before Aaron was ever thought of and considered. It's better He continues, he is without father or mother or genealogy. This is Melchizedek. We don't know anything. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the son of God, he continues a priest forever. Later down in Hebrews 7, here's what the author says. And this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Because he's from the line of Melchizedek and not the line of Aaron, it's better. You don't want him to be from the line of Aaron. Because from the line of Aaron, he has to offer sacrifices daily and every year for your atonement. But from the line of Melchizedek, he's always has been a priest, always will be a priest. It's what he's always done. It's better. It's a better covenant. You see, the former priests were many in number, excuse me, because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost He's able to save even the most despicable of us, the most broken and jacked up and dark of us who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. He's holy and innocent. He's unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those other high priests of Aaron's line to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests. But the word of the oath, Psalm 110, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. It's better. He's better than just being the Passover lamb. He's better than being a priest in the line of Aaron. He's better than that because his sacrifice was once and it was for all. Which means according to Hebrews 1, chapter 3, he can now sit down at the right hand of the Father. That's why we continue in Hebrews chapter 10. We learn that by the will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every other priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. I don't know how you are at your house. There's a difference between things being clean and things being tidy. Have you noticed that? Uh, I like things tidy. I like things to be organized. It gives the illusion of things being clean even when they're not. Uh, Meredith is not content with that. And so she's, she likes things to be clean and I appreciate her heart for cleanliness. Uh, and sometimes I help her. Uh, 
For many of us, here's our problem, is that we settle for a tidy relationship with the Lord when we've been given a clean relationship with the Lord. The Aaronic priesthood, that Levitical priesthood, will give you a tidy one. The Melchizedek priesthood will give you a clean relationship with the Lord. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet, which takes you back to Psalm 110. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. You know what tidying does? It leaves your lawless deeds around. You know what cleansing does? It casts them as far as the east is from the west. For where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. So hear me in this. It is miraculous and fantastic that Jesus is the Passover lamb. He is the sacrifice. I'm telling you it's better that he is the high priest who offered this sacrifice. No one took his life from him. He laid it down on his own accord. And that matters because he then is the high priest. He's the one who intercedes, which means, listen, every day of your life, the accuser tries to tell you how broken and sinful you are. And the accuser tries to tell God, you know what they've done? You've seen what they've done? You know what they've been doing? And God turns to his son and the son puts his nail-scarred hands in the face of the father and says, I paid for it. That's why this matters. It matters that you know you are no longer seen by the Father as broken and jacked up and a sinner. You are a saint. You are a son of the Most High. He loves you and sees you in all your perfection. So whatever you think about yourself that's so jacked up, I can't get out of my own way, I keep screwing up, I keep doing this, I keep falling into that sin, I can't get over this temptation, the Lord knows and the Son intercedes on your behalf. And God, who is holy and just and righteous, who has every right to punish the sinner, turns to your attorney, the son, the high priest, who says, no, dad, I paid for it. That is meant to bring us peace. Paul in Colossians says, it's by the blood of Jesus on the cross that he has reconciled all men to himself, thus bringing peace through the cross. Not just through him dying, through him offering himself as a sacrifice to die as the great high priest. That after making purification for sins, he sat down. It is finished. You get it? This is why it matters. It's why it matters that your church attendance is not an offering to get him off your back. It's done in joy that you get to. You're reading your Bible. You're you're not cussing at school because you think it's going to earn God's favor. No, 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 no. It's not a sacrifice. He doesn't need those anymore. It's been paid for. Doesn't need your lashings. Doesn't need your abstinence. Doesn't need any of it. What he needs is your heart fully surrendered to the finished work of Jesus. Because the question that Paul asks in Romans 8 is, well, who who is there to condemn? Who's accusing you? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he's the one who raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding, continually interceding for us. So 2,000 years ago, angels sang a song about good news, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill to men. But it wouldn't be until another 33 years that peace was finally accomplished. In Galatians chapter four, Paul tells us that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in the system of the law, for one reason, to redeem, call back those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. You want to know why Christmas matters? Because Good Friday and Easter matter. That's why it matters. 
if it wasn't for the shed blood of Jesus and his high priestly duty, this would just be about gifts and stockings and candy canes. But instead, it's about the beginning of a reconciling work that brought peace to your heart and to mine. And there's two areas of this peace that he brought through the blood of his cross. First, that you and I now have peace with God. God has every right in his holiness and perfection to demand sacrifice from us. It's created a distance, an enmity between humanity and God. There's not peace. There's not, if you don't know Jesus, there's not peace between you and the Father. And you feel it. You feel the unsettledness and the wrestlings. But for those of us who can call Jesus Lord, peace has been made for you and for me. We're no longer clamoring for his affection. We're no longer trying to prove our worthiness. It's not us that's worthy. It's the lamb who was slain that is worthy. And so when Jesus intercedes, he's not pleading to the Father based on your ridiculous good works. He's pleading to the Father based on his finished work interceding on our behalf. So we have peace with God. And when we have peace with God, then we have peace with others. James says it this way in James chapter one. He says, what? you know why there's quarrels among you? Like, you know, you know why you guys are fighting all the time? You know why in your marriage you're fighting all the time? It's probably, it's her problem. I get that. I understand. You want to know why? James tells you it's because you got junk within your own heart. That's why. Because you're not at peace. You're not settled. So we can talk about peace all we want and talk about how, yeah, 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 we believe this. My question is, do your relationships prove that you believe this? Because I promise you, every quarrel, every argument, every frustration on I-75 or on 81, every single one of them comes from the fact that you think you deserve something you aren't getting. And it comes from the fact that you think you've done enough to get it. You've proven it. You want to know why you're frustrated with your wife? Because you think she should treat you better than she's treating you. Because you've earned it. Because you put those dishes away and she should honor you for that. It all comes back to this idea for us. You want to know why? Because we don't believe we have a high priest. Because if you did... If you believe that everything broken within you has been covered by the shed blood of Jesus and he is interceding on your behalf, your heart would be so content in who God has created you to be and what he's given you to do, you wouldn't need a thing from anybody else. You wanna know how you know you believe the gospel? You believe you have a high priest interceding for you so you don't have to prove yourself to anybody. You can rest. That's the rest that we're promised in the book of Hebrews. It's all found through our high priest. So do you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning as we finish up? Maybe for you, you're still wrestling with the idea of your brokenness and your sinfulness. And honestly, you're pretty surprised the church hasn't burnt down already since you walked in an hour ago. I'm telling you, God doesn't work that way. And you gave your life to Jesus a number of years ago, but you just can't seem to get out of your own way. That thing keeps tripping you up and you're questioning everything and you feel like you're never gonna amount to anything and all the voices of the accuser, they sound like your dad, they sound like that coach, they sound like a pastor. I'm letting you know you've got a high priest who speaks a better word than that. Your sin has been fully, freely, and forever paid for. And there's nothing you can do to make it better or worse than that. It's done. It's finished. He sat down. He's interceding on your behalf. Which is why confession matters to us. We get to. It's not about us being pure before the Father. It's about us being pure in our own conscience. What we do when we're caught in sin tells us everything we need to know about how we view Jesus as the high priest or not. Your fig leaves aren't gonna cover, but he's made a way. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin, but there is. He came, 
He lived a perfect life and he died. But he gave his life as a ransom for many. He paid it. He sacrificed himself. He's the Passover lamb. He's the ram caught in the thicket. But better than that, he's a high priest in the order of Melchizedek who always has been and always will be interceding at the right hand of the Father for you. Can you rest today? Let it settle you today. No one's surprised that you're jacked up. The Father included. But he paid for it. Would you receive it today? Father, um, we're clamoring for peace. We all feel it. There's an anxiety we feel. It's just this low hum of agitation that many of us live with. For most of us, it's rooted in this very fact that we don't understand um, that it really is finished and paid for. There's nothing left for us to offer or to sacrifice. That all we do now is we rest under your finished work, believing you're interceding even now for us in our brokenness and sinfulness. And that doesn't just go for us, that goes for our friends and our family too. The ones that we think owe us something. It's not how the gospel works. So would you remind us this Christmas season of what happened? That the fullness of time God sent our high priest to redeem us, to make us sons now, no longer slaves. And we find rest and peace as your son and your daughter. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.